You ready? I'm ready. So we wanted to give you a bit of a boat tour. We're just in the middle of this beautiful bay here in Vanuatu. We're actually just around the corner from Champagne Beach, but that's pretty much Champagne Beach there too. And we thought it was time maybe to show you our boat, our 2005 Lagoon 410 that's been set up for extensive offshore cruising. Yeah, man. So we've been out here just over three and a half years now. I feel like we finally kind of have most things nailed. We're gonna do a detailed review of what we've done to set our boat up for offshore cruising. So we're actually gonna add some links down below of all the details. So you don't need to write anything down, just hit that link. We, we've, we've cleaned all day, like all day. We're a little slobby <laughs> and- uh, We are not slobby. <laughs> yeah, let's get into it. Let's get into this, this boat tour. So this boat, when we bought it, had, I don't know, 15 years, okay, it was only 10 years old, but 10 years of bottom paint. So we scraped 10 years of bottom paint off this boat, we ground it off, and then we put on, we actually put on hard paint, which is kind of weird. In hindsight, I probably would have gone with copper coat, but we're out here for so long that we find the hard paint uh, it doesn't come off as much as the ablative and that way we can scrub. It's important, you'll see. You grow weeds, it doesn't matter what bottom you have. This is probably our most recent addition. We added this code zero um, in New Zealand. We actually did have a code zero before that. It was uh, came with the boat, but it kind of like blew apart halfway across our Pacific crossing. So we put on a new code zero, um, which is on the attached to the bow sprit. And this one has umbrella, which some people will say is not so good because it's heavier and doesn't fly as well. We find that having this on a furler outside all the time is the most ideal thing for sailing because you'll use it. We love this sail. We use it all the time. The one thing that we are missing in our inventory, which is kind of on our radar if we can you know, make enough money going forward, uh, is to buy spinnaker. We blew up our spinnaker in the Caribbean. <laughs> we were good at blowing things up back then. And uh, so that's, that was lost to us. So we don't have spin right now, so we use this a lot. Anything further than a broad reach is a problem on a catamaran because the shrouds are so back, because there's no backstay. So you have to you have something for going downwind. Moving on. <laughs> so this is our, our old Genoa. This beautiful green Genoa has been with us a long time. It's seen a lot of places. This is original to the boat. Seen better days, but and the green color, oh, it's not my fave, but we'll work on this too. Um, every boat should have one of these uh, if, you, if you buy a boat. Oh, and I'm walking on the catwalk here. Somewhere along the line, some of the lagoons have the anchor, or a lot of boats have the anchor coming out right from the anchor locker there. Ours goes all the way down this catwalk and then out over the bow roller and into the ocean. Anchors are hugely important. We have a 33 kilogram rockna. It's just over there, holding us, holding us tight right now. So, um, yeah, it's it's important to have an anchor you're comfortable with and that you feel confident in, because it's kind of like what holds you to the bottom of the ocean and keeps you from moving around at night. So, we've been super happy with our rockna. Would buy one again in a heartbeat and uh, I recommend, totally recommend it if, if you're in the market for an anchor, don't hesitate, they're awesome. Uh, then we have our chain locker right here. We have two lockers up front on here on a lagoon and one we use for storage. If you had a generator, it would probably live in this particular cabinet. We don't have a generator. And then on this side, on the starboard side of the boat, starboard is your right, that's where our chain goes in. So this is our chain locker. Let's take a look. We have a LaFrance, the Franz Tigress windlass. And uh, this is what pulls your chain up and down. Uh, and then I've got a remote here. I also have a remote that's uh, wireless, but I don't tend to use it, I just use this. We have 80 meters of chain, it's about 250 feet. If I was to do it again, I'd get 300 feet of chain. It's just worth it, like, don't fuss around, get 100 meters, get 300 feet of chain. Life would be easier out here with that. So the chain lives in there, and then we have a bunch of road underneath. I don't think we've ever used the road, we just use the chain. So you need to have a good windlass if you're gonna cruise around the world. You don't wanna be pulling up your anchor. Inevitably, we know a few people that have had their windlasses break down, and it is awful. Like, if you have 100 meters of chain, and you're in 25 meters of water anchoring, 
you need to have a windlass that works. It's hard, it's hard on the, the windlass to pull up 25 meters of, of chain from the very bottom. The other thing to do is to download a manual for your windlass before you leave port because what happens is sometimes these things need a bit of service. So you gotta change the oil and do some things and Ben has had to uh, clean the brushes on this particular one several times. They just get gunked up and dirty and then the thing doesn't work. Like, inevitably it happens like when you're in the middle of nowhere and there's no one around. Actually, you don't want just your manual for your windlass, you need all your manuals for all your systems on your boat. And if you don't have them printed out because it's like crazy now to have them printed out, make sure you have them offline versions, like saved to your computer. Because you're gonna need stuff in the middle of nowhere when no one's around and inevitably you don't, and for some reason the internet isn't working. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. And then other thing in here is our water tank. We have a 300 liter plastic water tank in here. So a lot of boats have two 300 liter tanks. That would probably be nice. It's not required, okay? We, we make do, but we do have a water maker, which we'll get to in a bit. So if you have only one tank, 300 liters, I would say is probably only enough if you have a water maker. We also keep our extra propane tanks. Sometimes you get to areas where it's really challenging to get them filled. So we have extras and then we can decant. You know that, you go check out the episode where Ben shows you how to, uh, you know, yeah, don't do this at home. Check that episode out if you wanna learn how to do that. So moving on. Oh hey, welcome to the port side lockers. Sorry, I don't have boobs, but uh. So this is the other locker. So we're now on that side. In here we have all our sail inventory and our kites. We have uh, quite a few kites. And, and under all of that, dive compressor, which is right in here. When we want to uh, fill some dive tanks, I pull that out, put it on the back step, annoy the neighbors with our loud gas dive compressor. So yeah, this allows us to uh, go diving in some of the most remote areas because we only carry two tanks. So we call this locker here the garage. It basically holds everything that you would normally put in your garage. Actually, we have like three lockers that are like our garage. The entire boat has probably less space than the average garage though. So, you know, when things are full, it just is what it is. Sometimes they're just full. And just like that, it's closed. No one knows how much stuff is in there. <laughs> Should we stick with sails for a minute? Let's stick with sails. The main sail lives in the sail bag and it zips up in the sail bag and this protects it from the sun when you're not sailing. This sail bag, I made. I made it. Can you believe I made this? If you're an adventurous sewer, by all means, make your own. I'm not sure I'd make my own ever again. It was, it was a lot of work. Um, it was very, very much a lot of work. But if you do make your own, make sure you line it in Dacron. This is Sunbrella on the outside, and on the inside should be, um, so you can sort of see it here, but this one's all faded. It's Dacron. This is what sails are made of. So you should line your bag with that because these actually get beat up all the time. It's kind of crazy. And then if your boat doesn't have lazy jacks and you're planning on sailing around the world, Set yourself up some lazy jacks, man. It just makes life so much easier. All we do is undo the halyard and the sail just comes straight down in the bag. It's perfect. None of this flaking bag stuff, just magic. Magic, we like magic. So I just want to talk briefly about our mainsail. We just got a new one uh, last end of last season. And the thing that we did that we really love about our mainsail is we got a two-ply leech. So what that means is you can kind of see it. I can't really show it to you right now because it's like we'd have to hoist it up. But a two ply leash basically means the back end of the sail has two layers on it, and that's really good because it won't wear out as fast. That's typically the first spot where a mainsail will start to sag and get baggy. Okay, so this, like we said, this is detailed. So here's some of the deets. If you stick around long enough as in this video, we're gonna go over some really kind of detailed stuff about some of the things we've had to replace on a lagoon. So stick around to the end of the video. And if you own a lagoon and you have the traditional cars, you should take a look at this. Our head car, these wear out on lagoons. The head cars wear out. And they're usually the original ones from like 2005 were all with ball bearings. The new ones they have have these two rods in them and the rods hold the car onto the track. So the track has a groove here and the rods fit in the groove. If you don't have rods in your head car, go get yourself one if you're planning on sailing around the world. These are really hard to find out here. And if you've got a ball one, it's probably gonna break and wear out relatively soon. So do yourself a favor. It's worth the investment to be able to sail. 
We actually renamed Nahoa uh, our boat. Nahoa was called Maravilla. Nahoa means bold and defiant, and we just felt it meant more to us. Not that Maravilla was a bad name, it's just that Nahoa meant more to us, and it was nice and short. The very first things that we did that was really, really hard and a lot of work was to have this hard top built. It wasn't work for us. We actually paid someone to do this. It's a foam core. It's had the epoxy vacuum through it, so they did it in a vacuum sandwich. It's beautiful. Look at the curves on this baby. This hard top was built by just catamarans in Florida, and I, I don't know, we just, we got so lucky to find them. They're so fantastic. And you can walk on the top of it. It's great access. It's sometimes our favorite part place to watch sunset from. If your boat doesn't have a hard top, we've met people that have made them out of plywood with fiberglass. Just get creative. Talk to just catamarans if you're in Florida. They're wonderful. We love our hard top. We wouldn't have had it any other way. I highly recommend a hard top if, you, if your boat doesn't come with them. So next, let's talk about power. Power is like a huge thing on any boat. Did I mention we don't have a generator? Let's talk to Ben about how we make power on this boat. Is that better? That's better. Okay. So the most important thing out here is power. Uh, it controls if your fridge is run, it controls your autopilot, it controls your lights, it controls your comfort, how much fresh water you have. And yeah, like you need a lot of power for running all those things. So we have 1.2 kilowatts in the back here. Then we got the D400 up there. That generates about five amps, not a huge amount, but enough to keep us going through the night. We have these solar panels on top of an arch. And this is where most of our power comes from. Absolutely crazy how much power you get out of solar. Uh, you can't have enough solar out here. And then down here, I'll show you uh, where we keep all the charge controllers. So these are our back sugar scoops and they open. Um, inside we have storage, our charge controllers for our solar, our wind, as well as our steering arms. Come on, I'll, I'll show you. Okay, over here, the thing that's making all the noise is our solar charge controllers. It's really sunny today, so it's trying to burn off some of the heat. We have a FlexMax Outback 80 uh, charge controller. This is a critical component in how we transform our solar energy into 12 volt uh, power to charge our batteries. And then over here, we have our wind charge controller and dump resistors. This is our, our, our rudder with a steering arm, which we just had regalvanized. The port steering arm connects to the starboard steering arm via this big piece of metal right here. So the two are linked, obviously, so that when you turn, both rudders turn the same amount. This is our autopilot right here, autopilot ram. And then underneath, we always carry uh, jerry cans for extra fuel. And we also carry uh, lots of uh, water drinking water jerry cans uh, when we're out on a passage for a really long time. Reason being, if our water maker breaks, we're out of fresh water. Okay. So let's go inside. Let's, let's stop, let's stay, we're staying outside. So anything that's been sewn on this boat, I've sewn. I got myself a Sailorite as part of the first refit. As I already mentioned, I sewed the mainsail bag, I've sewed all the cushions, the windshield, any covers you see on the boat, shade curtains. If you're like at all handy, get us yourself a Sailrite. Uh, they have wonderful videos that teach you how to sew on their website, and they're fantastic. There's other versions of Sailrites, you don't have to get the Sailrite brand, but I, I've been really happy with mine. But this is where you can drive from, and because I'm a bit short, I actually like this up here. You can have autopilot on, and you can drive with your toes or something, or you can sit here, and you've got a good view of the sails, or the night sky. This is like the best stargazing spot. Let's talk about our nav stuff next. So we have two navigation systems up here. We use two iPads. This one has a Navionics, which is our main chart plotting kind of thing. And then we use satellite imagery on the second iPad. And they both are redundant. They both have both. But this is so awesome because the satellite imagery around here is so important. The maps are terrible here. You're like sometimes parked on land, according to Navionics. So satellite imagery is key. We use both Bing satellite and Google satellite imagery, and you can switch between the two. It's a program called Ovitel Maps, it's awesome. Both of these we hook up to a Bad Elf. We use a Bad Elf, there's so many of these out here, but a GPS puck. We have a couple of these pucks, uh, just in case one, I don't know, dies. So we're pretty redundant on our systems, and we're, we're super happy with this. We've navigated over halfway around the world with these. 
So we have actually one, two, three, four winches on this boat. Four winches. Um, all the lines are led back to the cockpit, uh, including all the reefing lines, all the halyards, all the genoa and main sheets. If you're like us, and you're just a couple, often at night uh, there's only one person on shift, you don't want to go forward. You want to stay in the cockpit, stay safe, and run everything from back here. So basically this boat's set up for single handing, which is uh, pretty important. It's a lifesaver. And come on in, let's check out some of our living space. We spend a lot of time in our cockpit, which is part of the reason we really badly wanted a hard top because it's so much nicer and so hot out in here in the tropics that it's awesome to have this shade cover. Uh, we've also built shade curtains that all roll down. The shade curtains help when the sun gets low in the sky and it's awesome. Highly recommend to get shade curtains. But this is uh, an awesome area. We entertain out here, we have a lot of fun out here, we spend a lot of time out here. We love having our table out here as well as the one inside. So the other thing you can see behind us here is my garden and behind the garden is the dinghy. The dinghy is probably, let's move the garden. This is a cool thing, eh? I got this in New Zealand, it hooks. It's meant to hook on a balcony, but it's awesome for the boat. My plants aren't doing so well now. Something happened, I don't know. Not really a good gardener either. <laughs> I let Ben talk to you about the dinghy. Okay, so this is our dinghy. We bought it three years ago. It's a 10 foot 6 uh, AB inflatable fiberglass bottom with Hypalon tubes. It's taken a beating, man. It's been three years and uh, we'll probably need a new one in probably two years, one year? I don't know. If we were to do it again, we would get a bigger dinghy. We would get a 12 foot with an aluminum bottom and a 30 horsepower outboard. I know that sounds insane. The dinghy is like your your, your transport, your car, that's how you get to the grocery store and back. And with a bigger dinghy, it's more comfortable, drier, you can go further, um, you can go in rougher conditions. So um, yeah, get as big of a dinghy as you, as you can. It's the one thing that we will be upgrading probably in the next couple of years when this one dies. So we do love our dinghy though. And our dinghy is, is actually really awesome. It's fast. Make sure you get a dinghy that's fast enough to get everyone on your boat on a plane and then you can change we've actually replaced the prop on this to be a slightly different pitch and that has been an amazing improvement for getting this dinghy out on a plane also notice back here we have a barbecue if you like to grill get yourself a barbecue and get yourself a good one yeah it's a round one i think they're slightly better in the wind but it doesn't matter get yourself a barbecue they're awesome then you don't have to turn on the oven and heat up the entire boat when it's like a billion degrees out Something else you'll notice here is the fishing rod holders. We like to fish. You gotta figure out your setup. It's also good to have a place to store your rods, so make sure you try and find a storage spot. We finally come up with a bit better of a solution. We keep our fishing rods right up there. Keeps them out of the salt and sun and uh, out, of, out of reach, easy reach. Let's go inside. Welcome to our saloon area. Catamarans are awesome. I cannot begin to explain to you how nice it is to have a big saloon like this. I love it because of all the windows. You get to see out, see the beautiful blue ocean. Oh my gosh, it's such a gorgeous day today. This is awesome. Look at how beautiful it is out there. You get a cook above deck. You got breeze coming in all these windows. I am a catamaran girl. I had to have the catamaran. So catamaran versus monohull, you guys make your own choice. But for us, we're certainly catamaran people. Okay, so let's talk galley. On our second refit that we did in New Zealand, you'll see from our previous Lagoon 410 walkthrough that there used to be a huge sort of banquet or thing that came out all the way to here. And it had a big back on it and this bench had a back. It was kind of nice but we ended up taking it out. This gives us so much more space in here. This is my kitchen, like my galley. Like it's huge for a boat, it's awesome. We love the 410 galley, I love it. So let's talk about what I would look for if I was ever buying uh, a catamaran ag again. Um, so on a catamaran, you don't really heal as much as a monohull. So when you're talking, even when we're offshore, I can still cook here. And I prefer to be up top, not down below. I think that's good when you're offshore, I really do. So I want to point out a few things that I've changed to make this galley amazing for me. Uh, first off, the stove. When this week this boat came with a two burner stove um, that was pretty small and I didn't like it. I actually think three burners is nice even just for the cooktop space because when you get a big pot on there, if you only have two burners, you can't get anything else on there. Next, fridges. 
We have a separate freezer down below and this normally was the freezer on a lagoon. I would say it's, it's very inefficient and it never really worked properly, but it works fantastic as a fridge. It has two plates here and we only use one. So we use half of the power that is really required um, to make it freeze and it uses less power that way. So basically I have two fridges and it's so necessary. Like one really isn't enough. Once you're out here for a long time, you'll realize like I can buy cheese in New Zealand and I can bring it to Fiji, but in Fiji, they really didn't have much cheese. So, you know, when you're provisioning to go a month uh, over the ocean or two months or whatever it is, you need lots of fridge space. And it really, really is awesome on this boat to have these both as fridges. So this is the top loader. It's got bins all stacked down so that you can get into like, uh, they have these vegetable fruit bins. They're pretty good. You can get yourself some of those. The top loader goes all the way down to like here. It's pretty hard to get stuff out of the bottom, but it's awesome. You can fit so much stuff in that. And Ben gets to put his beer in there, so he's pretty stoked too. This is our front loader. The front loader is kind of more like a regular fridge and it goes all the way back to here on this boat. What we love is that we have a separate freezer. We have an angle, you can get an angle, it's just a name brand, but it's just a small 12 volt freezer. Actually, I think ours is like 60 liters or something, it's pretty big, but I highly recommend getting one of those. They hardly draw anything, they don't eat much power, and they, they, oh, they work, like they actually work. So another thing you'll notice, when we first left, I had like no appliances. This boat's 220. So we left from America and it's a 110 in the United States. And it was 110 in Canada too, where we came from. So none of my appliances worked. You can get yourself a 110 inverter or I've picked up appliances around the world. And I know people are like, you don't need electrical appliances on a boat. You can, you can just use, you know, your hand grinder, your nut chopper, whatever it is, your knife. I love my appliances. I love them. This is a food processor, which I picked up in New Zealand. So happy, was so stoked. And then this is a yogurt maker. We love our yogurt maker. Sour, it makes sour cream, yogurt. We use it all the time and it's fantastic. It just works, like it actually works. Out here, sometimes yogurt is like not around. Like it just doesn't exist. So it's kind of nice to be able to have that small treat. Uh, and this thing is consistently works, so we love it. Check out that view again though. Isn't it awesome on a catamaran? Now let's talk about this side. I don't mind my sink. This was just standard, but the tap that came with this, holy smokes it sucked, okay? I think it was Amazon. And I found myself a proper tap. You can use a proper tap on a boat. It's ridiculous. And all the new ones for the homes have these huge water saving. We put this on and we use half the amount of water now. So in New Zealand, we decided to take this giant bench out to create more space. And in so doing, I was like, I think we should also extend this cabinet out just a little bit. So awesome to have a second worktop now or a third worktop. This changes our kitchen. Like it's now two people can work in here, no problem. I can't even begin to tell you how happy we are with this. We were very lucky. We met a lovely man named Neil. And I think you saw it in our new, you can check out our New Zealand refit video, but he basically, um, he did us a lot of favors and we're still so grateful. This is our favorite, my favorite change that we did in New Zealand. Storage is a huge thing on a boat. You need a place to put all your cups, all your plates, all your bowls, all your food, all your cutlery. And I'm talking like, we're not camping here. This is our home. So we have all the stuff that you have in your huge, ginormous kitchen. We pretty much have most of it on the boat. We have some collapsible bowls that fold in and stick under. We have Tupperwares. Yeah, you gotta find spaces for all this. So you have to be a bit organized. Under these benches is storage. And that's food storage. It's our pantry. We have enough food on this boat to probably last a long time, but um, it's the way it works when you're out here. You never know when you'll find something next. This is the one we changed, and Ben put on a little gas hinge so it opens and closes. It's perfect. Love it. So let's talk to Ben about how we navigate from inside. Okay, so just a quick review of our nav. We have a super old radar here. It's kind of doubles as a chart plotter, plotter but uh, we no longer have the chips for all the regions, so we just use it as a regular basic radar like we're talking like rings that tells you how many miles out and then like blobs showing up like it's pretty basic um, and then beside that we have our radium go this gives us our satellite uh, email satellite messages and tracking and weather yeah we download weather via this we have a, a stereo for music uh, VHF and our wind depth and speed in instruments. 
Right here, a couple of basic displays. On top we have fuel and water, and underneath we have our power system. So battery, power, input, and output. And that's basically it. Like our, our navigation is pretty simple. Uh, basically those two iPads out there with Navionics and satellite. And then inside we have OpenCPN with CM92 maps, as well as again, satellite imagery as well. AS is like uh, this automatic way uh, how boats broadcast to each other, telling them I'm here and I'm here. And then you can see if you're gonna collide and intersect. Uh, not all boats have AS, but we do and we broadcast as well as receive. We highly recommend AIS, uh, especially if you're gonna go offshore. Um, certain countries such as Fiji are right now talking about uh, not allowing anyone to come in that doesn't ha have AIS. I believe Indonesia, we're heading there, uh, also requires you to have AIS. So uh, AIS is really awesome to have. We've had people call us on the radio in the middle of the night, in the middle of the day, telling us, oh, hey, uh, you need to move this way. I'm running a huge fishing net out behind me. Um, and other times you're in like the middle of the ocean, you've been out at sea for say 14 days and some cargo ship calls you up and just wants to have a conversation. So uh, yeah, AIS is awesome. We love it. You should have AIS. This is not really part of navigation, but right over here we've mounted a TV and we use that uh, for entertainment purposes. Love our TV. We lay on the couch with a glass of wine and watch our TV. Over here, we carry an EPIRB. EPIRB sends a, a signal up to the satellites saying, uh, we have a serious emergency, we need immediate help. That signal then gets forwarded to the appropriate uh, authority to try and coordinate a rescue. Yeah, you should have an EPIRB. We actually have two EPIRBs. We have this one, and this is our big one, that goes with the boat, and then we have a personal EPIRB which we will attach to our life jackets when we're um, outside doing uh, single night shifts, or we'll take that personal EPIRB in the dinghy often if we're going a long ways. So Nahoa is an owner's version of Lagoon 410 and owner's versions typically go for about 15% more if you're looking at buying one. And I love my owner's version and I'll show you why. Let's go check it out. So the 410 owner's version is on the starboard side and uh, this is the, I guess what you'd call the master bedroom on our boat and basically this whole entire side is our bedroom. You want to check it out? Look at this. We can close off the rest of the world. We have beautiful windows to see out, lots of light. There's escape hatches here uh, if we ever need to, if the boat flips over and we ever need to get out, this is uh, how we get out. It's awesome. It's almost a king size bed in a Lagoon 410. So the owner's version has two closets, uh, his and a hers, which is another bonus. This is Ben's and moving forward. In the middle of the section here, we have a desk. There's a chair that pops out uh, underneath and you can Ben sits here often and edits videos. Uh, we have lots of storage for cookbooks, uh, reference books, all sorts of stuff. And then we have my closet, which is right here. And then we move forward. And this is why owner's versions are awesome, okay? Instead of a bed up here, like a charter version would have, this would be another cabin with another, another, another bed. What we have is a bathroom, a giant bathroom. So come check it out. So this is awesome, come in. It's, it's okay, you can come right in. This is our shower. It, isn't that great? Gotta love a big shower. I really want, I really like showering and you can shower outside, it's totally fine. I love, but I get cold and I love to come in here and be able to have a warm shower on like, I know it's ridiculous to get cold in the tropics, but it happens. So after a long dive or something, you get a bit chilly, come in here, you get all warmed up in your nice shower. It's fantastic. Then we have this nice vanity area in here and moving back, we have our head, you wanna switch? Which is, you know, just your regular hand pump toilet. And then this is, this is one of my favorite things on the boat. We did not have this when we bought the boat. This is something we've added and it's awesome. It's a washing machine. There was a space here for it. It's perfect. So most of the owner's versions also have space for a washing machine. Now that we're out here in these pretty remote places, getting laundry done is like such a chore and it's you have to pay someone, it's very expensive and you have to pay them and they take it away and you get most of your stuff back most of the time and it sometimes come back, comes back clean and sometimes doesn't. So it was pretty easy decision to get a washing machine. It pays for itself very quickly. I highly recommend it. If you have space, get one, just do it. 
I promise you'll be happy with it. So if you have a washing machine and you have like to have a shower or two and your water tank isn't ginormous so you don't have to you kind of have to fill it up every now and then you need to have a water maker and let's talk to ben about our water maker a couple quick notes about water makers i'll first show you ours and then we'll go over a couple of different ones so ours is in here basically we have an aquatech water maker it makes 60 liters an hour uh, we have a pre-filter here's the big uh oh it's still warm we ran it all today here's the uh the water maker itself and then we have the membrane in the bilge but to quickly back up a little bit there's there's a few water makers you can get uh, first off you can get a 12 volt or a AC uh, water maker AC water makers you have to have a generator for we love our 12 volt water maker it draws about 20 amps uh, so we are actually now with the solar uh, able to run our water maker without running our engines. And that's 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 a huge bonus. Because it's simple, simple to fix, simple to maintain. Unlike the some other kinds of water makers which automate the whole process of back flushing and and ramping the pressure up and doing all that, we have to actually turn the dial to increase the pressure and we actually have to do the back washing ourselves by turning some levers, but it's really easy which means that then if anything breaks, we can also fix it. If you're gonna go cruising long-term offshore, you gotta think about how you're gonna fix things by yourself because there's not gonna be a water maker specialist in some Vanuatu village. We've checked out the owner side, now let's check out the guest side. Let's head down to the port side of our boat. So down we have here, we have two berths. There's a back berth and a forward berth. The back berth is our guest room. So down here we're on the aft port side and this is the guest room. Underneath the beds on both sides are our engines. The I think the Lagoon 410 is the only lagoon with engines out of the bed. Ben's gonna show, show those to you in a sec along with all our batteries and all the other fancy stuff that's in there. But before that, let's check out the rest of the port side. So moving forward on the port side, we have our fuse panel. Uh, under here, under the fuse panel is our inverter and our battery charger. Uh, we've had to replace both these things in the last couple years. So our boat was about 10, 11 years old and they just both packed it in, both the battery charger and the inverter. If you've got a bigger boat, get a 3000 watt and up inverter because you're going to want to run all those awesome power things that you had at home when you're out here for years and years and years. So this is our port side head or our guest head. It's actually an awesome head. Come on in. It's awesome because it does have a separate shower and we've actually turned this shower on this side into storage because there's only two of us on the boat right now and really when we have guests, we our shower is so much nicer, we, we let people use it. But on the other hand, this is a perfectly good shower on this side too, but it's also a really awesome storage locker for wetsuits and dive gear. Come check it out. So this is where we store all our wetsuits, dive gear, our BCs, BCDs, uh, hats, and then we got like, like all the scuba gear and stuff is down below uh, in the bins, just lots of storage. Moving forward, this is our third cabin. So this boat has three cabins because it's the owner's version. This third cabin is our forward berth on the port side and it's fantastic. We use it for storage. We have extra provisions, uh, extra, extra beer and wine. If we find a cheap place to buy wine, we'll stock up a bit. Um, we have our angle freezer here. This is the angle, the freezer I was talking about before. It's beautiful, It's it works really good. We're really happy with it and it's so nice because it doesn't use nearly as much power as the other um, fridges, the, the big fridges. I highly recommend one of these if you aren't happy with your current freezer. Ben also has all his tools in here. So this is a workshop area and storage, so storage workshop storage workshop but you know we also have the food saver one of those vacuum packing things awesome okay one more thing we got to show you is the engines and the batteries which are right back here under this bed basically what you have what you have is a nicely made bed and then you can flip up the cushions we have 40 horsepower yanmars we're loving that the engines are under the beds a lot of people uh kind of hate on that uh, we love it because we've had to do some stuff underway sometimes like sometimes in big seas fuel filters get clogged and stuff like that if they're in the back pontoon it's really like not cool to open that back pontoon if there's 
big waves and then try and get in there to, to, to change a fuel filter. So having the engines inside the boat, first off, allows you to work on them if, 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 if it's rough out and you're underway. Second off, it prevents like basically any salt from touching the engine, which means they're in mint shape. There's no rust on them or anything. Um, and then right here, we have uh, two 300 amp hour lithium batteries, meaning we have a total of 600 amp hours of lithium. And that, that was an addition two years ago, and we're loving it. The reason we love our lithiums is we can draw it down to, I don't know, something like 10, 10, 10 volts. Um, whereas a uh, lead acid battery, you have to keep uh, more topped up. So it doesn't give you as much rain. Anyways, that's, that's about it. I mean, I don't, I think we've covered it all. We've, we've shown you every little nook and cranny on this boat, I think. I think it's time for some beer. It's always your thing. It's beer time. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed the tour of our boat. We love our boat and we're so happy to like share it with you. It was cool. We just want to touch on a few things that we think are necessary for a blue water or offshore cruising sailboat, especially a offshore sailing catamaran. Long term. Long term. So it's not something, these are things that you may f may not think are required and they probably aren't. Obviously there's outliers, there's people that don't have fridges, don't have fresh water, and then there's people on 60 foot, 80 foot, Hundred, we saw 150 foot, 150 boat, meter, 150 meter monohull the other day that have all sorts of stuff. So, but we're going to touch on kind of what we see is the most common thing out here and what kind of systems those people have. Um, we've been out here three and a half years, so we have a pretty good idea. Let's talk about boats. Let's talk about boat sizes first. So most people are between 37 to 48 feet in terms of their boat selection. Um, that's, length. Yeah, length. That's both for monohulls and catamarans. So most catamarans are probably 40 to 48. Yeah, we're actually a smaller catamaran out here. We're about 40, we're 41. And we don't see very many smaller cats in us. I th I'd say the average is around 40, 45, 46. 46, there's a lot of leopard 46s, there's a lot of... Um, Lagoon 440s, 450s, yeah. 480s, yeah. whatever there. Yeah. 500s. Yeah, not so many 500s. And then for the monohulls, we're finding, um, we're seeing a lot of 40 to 50 feet. Probably, and you could probably narrow that down a little bit more, but that's typically what people are cruising. There's a very good reason for this. That is a sweet spot for affordability, for comfort, comfort, stowage, and handling. Because when you're out there and you're sailing and you're maybe your rest of your crew is down below sleeping, you need to have a boat you can manage by yourself. Briefly touch on kind of the major components that we have and that most people have out here in order to sail and cruise long term. Comfortably. Comfortably. Mostly it's about what you can afford and what you're willing to tolerate because we've met people on 30 foot boats with no fridge and no freezer. Three dudes living on it. And they're still having an awesome time. We were hoping this would be sort of a long-term thing and I wanted some of the comforts that we are used to and at home and so the main components I guess for that it all starts around power and really if you don't have enough power on your boat nothing else works yeah without power you're gonna not gonna have enough power to make water because running a water maker uses a lot of power you're not gonna have enough power to run fridges you're not gonna have enough power to run an autopilot constantly charge your laptops like there's a lot of things that come down to it to power so for us that's that means solar wind generator and then the other thing that often out here is overlooked by new cruisers is sail inventory. Having a good mainsail, having a good Genoa, a Code Zero, having a spinnaker, having different weight sails really determines how fast you're gonna do a particular passage. And that translates to sometimes many days less of sailing. That means your weather window is shorter, and that means you can 
be out here in more comfortable conditions. The dinghy, the dinghy is, is your car, it's your vehicle to get you to shore, to the grocery store. You want a big dinghy, you want a reliable engine. Uh, you, you might not need a big dinghy, and it has to fit with your boat too, right? Like you have to have one that fits on your davits, or you can hoist onto your bow. And there's a lot of different thoughts on dinghies, but personally for us, we do a lot of water sports. We felt we needed a dinghy that was power enough, full enough, that if we need to do a rescue with uh, ben on a kite or me on a kite that we could go and catch the person on the kite and and go rescue them And it's it's our dinghy is good enough for that Make sure you get one that is reliable because out here. It's like you the worst the worst thing is to have to like Every time you pull into port go and try and get your engine fixed. It just sucks man Everything out here is gonna break uh, you're gonna have engine problems. You're gonna have sail problems rigging problems uh, structural problems possibly so just you need to carry enough parts you need to carry enough tools to fix your boat out here especially when you go cruising for many years what about the million dollar question catamaran versus monohull well for me there was no question we were monohull sailors big time monohull sailors we raced we loved monos they go up wind it depends what you want to do for us we wanted to cruise around the equator uh, in warm weather in tropical places, we wanted a catamaran. Like I, for me, hands down, it's the best platform for what we're doing. Does this boat go upwind well? Mm, not great. I mean, we can sail at 35, 40 degrees off the wind, but it's it's painful, right? And tacking, oh my gosh, forget it. I mean, it's almost yeah, my it's atrocious. But uh, you have to remember, like we're going around the world going west which means the trade winds are behind us because the trade winds north of the equator blow this way south of the equator this way so we pick our seasons right and we go with the wind we so. go downwind where we go broad reaching or reaching <laughs> we don't go upwind so it kind of depends like if you're racing yeah you don't want a catamaran you want to be able to go upwind well not a cruising catamaran maybe and also there's people that want to cruise around in this, the really southern latitudes or the really mm -hmm. northern latitudes. Mm -hmm. And then you might want to look at a different type of catamaran or a different type or metal boat or a boat that actually can go upwind because you probably will be doing a bunch of that. And yeah, this might not be the best boat for you if that's what you want to sail. So pick the boat that suits you and suits what you want to do with it. Thanks for watching this video. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed it. We know it's a bit long. Basically, this is our home. We've turned this boat into our home and it's got a little bit more clutter and a little bit more stuff but we're so grateful to have this boat as our our living platform yeah it's awesome we love this boat it's yeah. perfect so thanks for watching i'm gonna put a link down below of all the details that we've done to this boat 